They're very slick. They don't leave any traces of their presence. What was it? I don't know. Each of these people, in his own way, is an investigator, compelled by a personal experience to search for clues to the oldest mystery we know. Are we alone in the universe? The answer, if they were to find it, would be the greatest revelation in human history. Ordinary people. Searching for UFOs. Meet Ray, retired weapons analyst, researcher, and teacher. Marty, pilot, aviation historian, and writer. Chris, publisher and musician. John, self-taught electronics expert. Tim, documentary photographer. And a man we'll call Dr. X, an anesthesiologist who wishes to remain anonymous. These are the people you will get to know in this program. They are part of a movement called ufology, based on the letters UFO, an abbreviation that has come to mean much more than unidentified flying object. Ufology is many things to many people, but to these people, it is an investigation. Each of them had an experience that makes no sense, an experience that changed their lives. Ever since, they have been seeking clues to understand what happened to them. In the process, they find themselves grappling with a much larger question that affects us all. Is there life elsewhere in the universe? Many believe the UFO story began here with the atomic bomb. People have seen strange things in the sky since ancient times, but the number of sightings seemed to suddenly make a quantum leap shortly after the atomic bomb. Which leads some to wonder, when we humans let the nuclear genie out of the bottle, did we inadvertently send an atomic smoke signal to the universe? Shortly after the atomic bomb ended World War II, a wave of UFO sightings hit the U.S. It began with a private pilot named Kenneth Arnold. The Associated and United Press all over the nation have been after this story. It's been on every newscast over the air and in every newspaper I know of. And this afternoon, we are honored indeed to have here in our studio this man, Kenneth Arnold. Go ahead, Kenneth. They seem to flip and flash in the sun just like a mirror in such a way that it, it almost blinded you when you when you looked at, at them through your plexiglass windshield. It's just as much a mystery to me as it is to everyone else who's been calling me the last 24 hours wondering what it was. Kenneth Arnold had no name for what he had seen, but when his story broke, the press came up with one. Flying saucers. And less than two weeks later, young Ray Fowler found himself being pulled into the flying saucer mystery. Ray Fowler's been investigating UFOs for his entire adult life. My interest in UFOs goes back to my teen years. I was extremely interested in astronomy, and I was interested in experimental aircraft and our experiments with the V-2 rocket and space travel. So when UFOs or flying saucers or flying disks hit the headlines back there after Kenneth Arnold's sighting on June 24th, 1947, I began collecting articles and reading about these strange objects. My interest peaked when I was working on a farm in Danvers on July 4th, 1947, and something made me look up. And I th thought I saw a parachute coming along, and as it got closer, I saw no shroud lines, and it got still closer, it was a disc-shaped object. And as I watched and yelled for people to look behind me, and no one was interested, they were way behind me, it began to come down in a falling leaf motion, and I watched it slowly in this falling leaf motion go behind the trees. And I began to thinking, well, maybe it was a parachute. Maybe I just didn't see the shroud lines and I didn't see the pilot. But there was nothing in the paper about a crashed aircraft either. So I went through this escalation of theories, of hypotheses, trying to figure out what this was. 
the escalation of theories and hypotheses never ended. In fact, for Ray Fowler, it has become a way of life. Fifty years after that sighting in 1947, he is still searching for answers to the UFO question. This man is also a UFO investigator. His name is Marty Caden, and like Ray, he was a young man when Ken Arnold's sighting first made the news. Marty's a science writer and aviation historian, with over 150 books to his credit. As a journalist, he covered the space program for 30 years. Several of his science fiction novels have been made into feature films and hit TV series. He's won every major aviation and space writer's award there is. But most of all, Marty Caden is a pilot. Clear! He's been an aviator for 52 years, and in that time he's flown everything with wings. When Marty Caden talks about aviation, he knows what he's talking about. Uh, Mitchell Farmer with five people aboard. Marty knows perception is everything to a pilot. His life depends on it. But he also knows pilots sometimes see things here in the sky. He knows because it happened to him. We're flying along on a twin-inch bomber, very much like this one. Now we're coming south through Florida, and uh, we're just about the same altitude, a few thousand feet above the ground, when suddenly one of the men in the back of the airplane reported that we had a bright light coming down toward the aircraft behind us. And the closer it came, the more it looked like a disc instead of just a light. It was a disc reflecting sunlight. And it came from behind us over here, and came rushing up, and then suddenly it dove and passed beneath the airplane. So, we look it down, and there goes this thing along the ground, and we can see the shadow of the B-25. We had a wingspan of about 72 feet. This thing was twice as wide as the B-25, and we could see its shadow clear as a bell on the ground, and there we were right after it. We said, let's try and pull up alongside, see what the hell this thing is. The closer we came to it, the more it pulled away from us. Even pilots' eyes might mistake a flash of light for a solid object. That's why radar is an aviator's best friend. We called Patrick Air Force Base with the radar tracking. He picked up two targets, us and the disc. And finally that sucker just took off at about 4,000 miles an hour. And we were preparing to try to catch it. We pulled up, went down, went around. And Patrick said, forget it, he's gone. gone, but not forgotten. What was it? I don't know. I'd like to know what it was because I've been flying for 52 years. I've been flying over oceans, deserts, mountains, seen all kinds of things in the air, and this one is totally, absolutely baffling. And so a movement is created, one by one. Isolated individuals have an experience they cannot explain. They find themselves drawn into a mystery that even 40 or 50 years later still holds them in its grip. Ray Fowler, Marty Caton, citizen investigators, searching for UFOs. There is an unseen presence that hangs over the ufology movement. A silent member of the group, if you will, always standing on the outskirts of the gathering, not participating in the debate, and not really trusted by the others. Yet, this particular member of the ufology movement is never far from the discussion. When you start talking about UFOs, you hear allegations of governmental cover-up, you know, starting from right after World War II. It was a big uh, cover-up in the beginning. Things that have been covered up for decades are just coming out. The silent participant, whenever the subject of UFOs is discussed, is, of course, the United States government. Ray Fowler and Marty Caden have had plenty of dealings with the government. They both used to be on the inside. Ray, a supervisor at GTE on the Minuteman missile. And Marty, an investigator for the Air Force. Marty's first big investigation was the case of Air Force Captain Thomas Mantell killed in action while pursuing a UFO. I was stationed at uh, Mitchell Field in New York. I was in the intelligence office. 
Anything that came into our airspace belonged to us in terms of identifying it or intercepting it with our fighters. And we're going to report that uh, four Mustang, four P-51D Mustang fighters, had been victimed by the tower at uh, Godman Field, Kentucky, to go after a strange object in the sky which seemed to be very high over the city and uh, was alarming people because it wouldn't respond to any communications of any kind. Object directly ahead and above. Moving about half flight speed. It appears metallic. A tremendous size. Three of the men did not go all the way as high as their airplanes could fly because they lacked oxygen, which had not been placed on the airplane that day. Mantell, more excited than the others, reported he was seeing something that was very huge and silvery and gleaming in the sky. I'm going after it, he said. I'm still climbing. Object is above and ahead. Moving about my speed and faster. Uh, I'm trying to close in for a better look. Next story we got to when I was sent down there was that the object had attacked Mantell. Mantell's airplane impacted the ground at about 700 miles an hour. There were no witnesses to whatever had happened between Mantell and that UFO. Some thought Mantell had flown too high and passed out from lack of oxygen. Others who knew his service record said he was far too good a pilot to be that careless. Some accounts even suggested Mantell had been chasing the planet Venus. Marty Caden believes the UFO Mantell was pursuing was a skyhook balloon, part of a government program that was top secret at the time. The controversy was never completely put to rest. The only thing everyone could agree on was that Mantell went up chasing a UFO and came down dead. And now that one of their own pilots had died pursuing one, the Air Force was starting to realize just how serious the UFO problem could be. Not that they had been ignoring flying saucers. Even before Captain Mantell's death, the Air Force had begun looking into UFOs. Their first official investigation was codenamed Project Sign, later called Project Grudge. In 1947, when UFOs were reported flying discs, as they were called in those days, uh, the government took it very seriously because their own pilots and uh, airline pilots were seeing these things. So the Air Material Command initiated an investigation and came to the conclusion that uh, the objects were real, not visionary, and uh, initiated uh, a proposal for a larger project. Uh, this project was called Project Sign, started in 1948. The Air Force was hoping to explain the flying disks, but the more they investigated, the more questions they uncovered. The personnel within Project Sign came to the conclusion that uh, there was no other explanation. They weren't Russian, they weren't ours, they were not made by any foreign country, that they must be interplanetary. Uh, the personnel within Project Sign were reassigned, and new people were brought on board and told that uh, they must come up with uh, conventional explanations for these things. But the Air Force had no conventional explanations. And no matter what they said, people didn't believe them. The Air Force has been accused from time to time of hiding information about the UFO. What do you have to say to that kind of thing? Police charges are absolutely untrue. Actually, the United States Air Force releases statistics on the UFO phenomena through the Department of Defense press desk periodically. And we've always honored accredited media when they want to investigate a given specific sighting. There's nothing to hide. There's nothing to hide at all. But it seemed like the more they tried to explain away UFOs, the more the sightings multiplied. The worst moment ever for the Air Force came in July 1952, when a rash of sightings occurred in the most awkward of all places, Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is sacrosanct. You can't fly over an area called P-56. That's the White House, prohibited Area 56. And these things were flying anywhere they wanted to go. And the sightings were coming in a wave. July 10th, July 14th, July 19th, July 26th, 1952, the Washington wave peaks. Over 40 years later, that night is still clear in the minds of two men working in the tower and radar room at Washington National Airport. For air traffic controller Joe Zacco and radar operator Ray McInnes, it started with a sighting. And we observed this bright light to the northeast of Washington. At the same time, they picked up unidentified targets on radar, headed straight for Andrews Air Force Base. 
I looked down at the radar scope, and there was a trace going from northeast of Washington to the vicinity of Andrews Air Force Base. At that very moment, the Capital Airlines DC-4 was approaching to land. At the controls was Captain Casey Pierman. He heard some reports of these foreign objects, and he said, if you see anything in our vicinity, he said, uh, how about uh, giving us a call? I said, you know, I said, you do have a target off your left at a half mile. I said, unidentified. He said, yes, I see it. He said, boy, is it bright. And just then, the target disappeared. He said, it went straight up. The president was getting upset. Chief of staff was upset. They said, knock these things down. And the answer was, knock what down? When Air Force fighters arrived, the UFOs vanished. The next morning, the press had a field day, and the Air Force had a problem. There's no way to defend against something if you don't know what it is. And despite all the sightings, nobody knew for sure what they were seeing. There's a rule in the military. If you don't know, shut up. Never admit you don't know. Refuse to answer or classify the subject so you can't be misquoted. It was too late to classify the Washington wave. It was all over the news. The Air Force had learned a painful lesson. From now on, UFO sightings, even by commercial pilots, would be kept classified. Pilot sightings were to be reported immediately to the Air Force, but not mentioned to the public. The United States government had taken the first step toward keeping its work on UFOs secret. But behind the scenes, the Air Force UFO investigation was busier than ever. Now called Project Blue Book, it would eventually investigate thousands of cases over 20 years. Until now, the Air Force had only occasionally consulted with serious scientists about UFOs, but with the problem getting worse, they decided to call in an expert astronomer, Dr. J. Allen Hynek. Hynek was an eminent scientist and eventually became a colleague and personal friend of Ray Fowler. Dr. Hynek had impeccable scientific credentials. He was professor of astronomy at Northwestern University. He was a director of the Lindheimer Astronomical Observatory. At one time, he was the associate director of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. He was chosen to track Sputnik from uh, uh, a volcano on Hawaii. Uh, and he was chosen to be the chief scientific consultant to uh, Project Sign, Grudge, and Blue Book. Heinick started out a skeptic on UFOs. He thought the sightings were a craze that would soon go away, like the hula hoop. But he kept an open mind and tried to apply scientific standards to his investigation. The most provocative sightings, objects appearing at distances of 500 feet or less, he named close encounters and devised a system for classifying them into different kinds. Heinick wanted to prove scientifically that UFOs could be explained away. But over the course of his life, he uncovered evidence he could not dismiss. And since only seldom do instruments record flying saucers, it's the people who report seeing them who are the most significant way of getting at the truth. Today, ten years after his death, Alan Hynek's devotion to the scientific method and the change that it caused in his opinion are legendary among UFO investigators. All across America, there were people who thought UFOs were a question like morality or the environment that was too important to dismiss. And whether the government had indeed dropped the issue or just wanted people to think it did, the sightings never stopped. So in the tradition of American grassroots activism, individuals across the country began attempting to fill the void created by the Air Force. The civilian organizations researching UFOs came about really as almost a protest against what civilians uh, uh, were being told what UFOs were. Uh, people would see structured objects and would be told they were seeing Venus or a weather balloon. And people who had good credentials were being ridiculed, really, uh, because of government statements. The citizen investigators do what they do because they believe if there is even one iota of possibility that UFOs are in any way real, then someone should be pursuing the question. 
Perceiving an absence of official action, they take it on themselves. For its part, the Air Force has never forgotten the 1950s and the lessons of Mantell and the Washington Wave. Whether it has no answers or doesn't want to share what it knows, the Air Force public policy on UFOs continues to be silence. Planet Earth, home to every one of us, from the dedicated ufologist to the doubting skeptic. However we feel about UFOs and whatever we do about them, we feel it and do it from right here. Which, from the point of view of the UFO investigator, presents a formidable obstacle. The lack of evidence. How does one investigate the question of life elsewhere in the universe when one is confined to our small planet? All the evidence we have seems to exist only in the mind's eye. The clues are most often anecdotes, extraordinary tales told by ordinary people. With plenty of eyewitnesses but little hard physical evidence, the heart of the UFO mystery lies in perception. This, then, is the dilemma of the UFO investigator. How to decipher evidence derived largely from perception? The answer, in a word, innovate. With so much unknown, there is no single technique for investigating UFOs. Each investigator develops the tools and the methods that he or she finds most promising. Case in point, Chris O'Brien. His search for evidence has brought him to a very unusual place. The San Luis Valley, Colorado. People arrive here and they don't even know why they're here. They just know they have to be here. I didn't quite feel that compulsion. Um, however, I did early on identify that I possibly had a role to play and this place was key to it. For Chris, investigating UFOs starts with being in the right place at the right time. And he's discovered that here in the San Luis Valley, almost any time is the right time to see a UFO. This may be one of the strangest places in the whole country in terms of the activity that goes on here. We have a variety and intensity of unusual objects and occurrences. In the sky, weird lights and unexplained sounds at night. And on the ground, a bizarre string of unusual animal deaths. One man's strangeness is another man's opportunity. For Chris O'Brien, whatever is going on in this valley adds up to one thing. Evidence. There's a major, major chunk of data that can be gleaned from the things that have been reported here, and nobody has bothered to do it. And I felt compelled to elect myself to fill that role of being the person that documents and tries to get down in one place all the events that have been reported here. And I think it could really give us some major clues and maybe possibly furthering our understanding of these things that I'm investigating. Chris started a newsletter the mysterious Valley Report, and spread the word. If anything unusual was going on, he'd like to know. It wasn't long before his telephone became a virtual hotline for the paranormal. As you know, I, I wanted to... Now that people know that I'm here, you know, there's no question that uh, I will find out. If somebody sees something in this valley, uh, within seconds, minutes, or days, I will find out about it. I just wanted to let you know what I seen last night when I came back from Denver. Oh, you had a sighting, huh? Yeah. Uh, do you mind if I put my tape recorder on real quick? One more story of a sighting. One more bit of anecdotal evidence. Uh, we seen some blue lights similar to the ones that we seen earlier in the summer. No traces have been left behind. No photographs exist. Just one woman's perception. A skeptic could easily dismiss it as nothing. But Chris O'Brien has heard too many stories that can't be dismissed. Some told to him by the most reliable of sources, and involving some very high-level players. Cheyenne Mountain, Colorado. Deep inside this mountain is NORAD, the Air Force electronic eye on the sky. If anything enters U.S. airspace from this world or any other, NORAD will detect it and sound the alarm. Perhaps coincidentally, the Air Force built NORAD right next door to the mysterious valley. 
where all the strangeness and UFO activity keep Chris O'Brien so busy. Ever since it was built, NORAD's been like a secretive neighbor here, wanting to know all about everyone else's business, while revealing little of its own. We had one of the dark horse events in ufology uh, occur here when NORAD called the Rio Grande County Sheriff and the undersheriff Brian Norton uh, answered the call. It sounded like something from space had crashed into the mysterious valley and NORAD wanted the sheriff to do a ground search. That seemed pretty reasonable to Sheriff Norton. All part of the job. We got a report. What they said on the, on the computer was that it was a large explosion. They said the coordinates would have been in the Rock Creek area. Then things started to get a little odd. Uh, they called back 30, 40 minutes later and gave us a complete separate set of coordinates, which they say when they work that out would be over in the Fuchs Reservoir area. I set down a ground crew, got a helicopter, or not a helicopter, but a plane in the air, fixed wing airplane. We flew until dark. Uh, drove after dark in four-wheel drive vehicles and checked with the residents see if they'd seen or heard anything um, and, and come up with nothing. NORAD is the most sophisticated space tracking network there is. They monitor more than 5,000 objects 24 hours a day, right down to a screwdriver that floated away from the space shuttle. Yet, they couldn't seem to get their coordinates right for Sheriff Norton. Because NORAD steered him to two different locations, Norton and his men spent two days on a wild goose chase over thousands of acres. By now, Sheriff Norton was thinking it was more than odd. It was suspicious. Maybe NORAD intentionally misled him. Maybe they didn't want him to find whatever had crashed in the Greeny Mountain area. The afternoon of the 13th when I called Major McCouch and talked to him and... and he told us that there was no reason for us to even look any further. I've got people calling up that there's black choppers flying around, no markings. When we called around to White Sands Missile Base up to Colorado Springs, they said they had no knowledge of any night uh, maneuvers going on, that they didn't fly at night. Then I got a report early in the morning about 7.30 of three B-52 bombers uh, in a staggered formation, wingtip to wingtip. They come flying across the valley, traveling in the southwest direction, dropped altitude, flew right over Greeny area, which is in the Bishop Rock area, which the first coordinates would have been in that area. After this whole thing went down uh, and we were doing our investigation, I called Chris O'Brien because he he's stays up on that, on the sightings and whatnot, uh, up in the northern end of the valley. I investigated the event as thoroughly as I could, um, but one thing that really kind of sort of bothered me about the whole sequence of events was the obvious uh, interest that our military or some military, quasi-military organization showed in, in the Greeny Mountain area where this thing was reported. Was it an Air Force crash? A meteorite? Or something else? NORAD wasn't saying. There's been speculation that it was a UFO. I believe that NORAD knew what it was. Um, like I've said time and time again, I think the, the government probably knows what it is, and they found out what it was, changed their coordinates, and they didn't want us to know what it was. Eerie lights in the sky, strange sounds at night. Cryptic telephone calls from NORAD asking for help. A sudden frenzy of secret military air activity, and then silence. Whatever it was had been taken care of. There's a lot of people in, in my county jurisdiction that would like some answers. For the Air Force, it was all over. End of story. Forget it ever happened, Norad said. Under Sheriff Brian Norton is no ufologist. He's just a guy trying to do his job. But here in the mysterious valley, even a county undersheriff, whether he likes it or not, finds himself drawn into the mystery of UFOs. As for UFO investigator Chris O'Brien, the NORAD event was just one more puzzling case. One more set of clues that indicate something's going on, but don't tell the whole story. Yet another reason to keep on investigating. The very same kind of nothing was being seen in Michigan in 1966. Only then the Air Force called it swamp gas. 
No, we, no, I could, when you looked at it through the binoculars, it was like spherical, and there were two yeah. red lights at the yeah. sun, and a real pale, it looked like green light That's at that. Yeah, and that was a lips. Yeah. We, first I thought it was a helicopter. An entire dorm of co-eds and their dean saw something hovering in the night sky. Also among the witnesses were a dozen cops called to the scene. The bottom was a bright red. With all these witnesses, the story got big in a hurry. So the Air Force called in their scientific consultant, Ray Fowler's friend, Dr. J. Allen Hynek. It became a case that Hynek would long regret, a case where he found himself doing more public relations than investigating. Well, the uh, Project Blue Book at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base uh, suggested that I might come here and uh, get a line on what has been going on. He was actually there to give a line, the Air Force line. Heineck uh, got up in front of the cameras and said that what was seen uh, at uh, Michigan was swamp gas. This was one of the sightings that certainly would never have matched swamp gas, which is uh, very rare in any account. And there was wind that day, and, and swamp gas would be just little, little pieces of flame about this big going off and on. Uh, it was ludicrous. Heineck would do the best he could to convince people of the swamp gas story, but it wouldn't be easy. How much of it is a, um, a sort of spread by contagion, so to speak? Good luck, Doctor. Well, I'll need it. Thank you. For the Air Force, the Michigan case was a fire they needed put out. For Alan Hynek, it was a compromise with his principles. Dr. Hynek visited here one day at my home, and uh, I asked him about this swamp gas uh, story. And he said that since he worked for the Air Force, that uh, he had to do exactly what he was told. And Major Quintanella said that some of these objects were seen in a swamp. Think of what might be seen in a swamp that might be misinterpreted. Tell the press about it and then get out of town. Heineck said, I did exactly that. And if I were to say anything else, I might not be able to stay as a, a consultant to Project Blue Book. The Michigan sightings were a rude awakening for Alan Heineck. They made it painfully clear that to the United States Air Force, the real priority was public relations and not the question of life elsewhere in the universe. Are we alone in the universe? With a question that big, no one has an inside track on the answer. The lone citizen investigator and the million dollar government agency are in the same boat. The only way to find out is to search. What we plan to do is systematically search all of the sky that is visible from Goldstone out in California, and we're hopeful, and we can't predict the probability of success, that we might just find uh, signals from other civilizations. Contact. Proof that we're not alone. NASA began SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, because some of the best minds in science said it was worth doing. It is now okay to talk about life elsewhere, or intelligent life elsewhere, whereas a decade or two ago, it wasn't okay. It was considered too speculative to be worth any investment of time. Maybe, the scientists said, just maybe, contact could happen. Life must exist in the universe, and it must exist quite abundantly. Anybody with any equipment anywhere with the right way of looking can find it. But it won't be easy. It's a needle in the most gigantic haystack in the, in the universe. Still, in spite of the odds and the cost, America went ahead with Project SETI as our best hope for contact. But Project SETI isn't our only hope. Not everyone who dreams of contact works at NASA. The thing we've been trying to accomplish for the last 22 years or so is to try to home in extraterrestrial intelligences and or interdimensional whatever they be. We want to lure them into the test tube here. Meet another UFO investigator, John Shepard, citizen inventor. John knows the one thing that ufology most lacks is hard scientific data. So he's made it his life's work to obtain some. These things are said to give off electromagnetic interference, energy fields, this sort of thing. 
and we wanted to lure them in close enough here to a laboratory setting where we could take electronic, electromagnetic, or spectrum measurements. Get something on tape, get something on instrument meters that you can actually measure time, event, uh, intensity, and frequency, and something you can share with other researchers. Ever since he was a boy, John has had the same dream as the scientists at SETI, contact. Inspired by a sighting he had 22 years ago and encouraged by his grandparents, John began to construct his own radio equipment to reach out to space. He called it Project Strat, Special Telemetry Research and Tracking. It started out in a corner of the living room. As John's vision grew, so did the project. It got to the point where machines have spread out into the living room, and we're talking about 19-inch racks, 8 feet high, some of them, and it was getting very cramped. So we decided to build an addition onto the house, which ends up being 740 square feet, two stories high, that we could house the laboratory itself in. Everything John knows about electricity, he taught himself. He's a modern-day Thomas Edison, doing science the old-fashioned way. Alone. No government or university funding. Every circuit, socket, and diode in this place was put together by him. From power company cast-offs or military surplus. There are 60,000 volts running through his basement, powering a signal that's beamed straight out into space. John has no definite proof, but he thinks his signal may have had an effect. We had some close encounters of the second kind here. We had quite a few very close uh, sightings of uh, small satellite objects darting across highways in front of people's vehicles. So things like this started happening very rapidly, about a year after we went on the air in 72. Shortly thereafter, a small collective was formed. When all those sightings started happening, John needed a baseline reference, a way to separate the false alarms from genuine sightings. So he devised an experiment to test human perception. A UFO decoy hat. The hat is a device that allows me the ability to analyze people's psychological reaction and interpretations of a visual phenomenon. With the decoy hat on his head, John goes out where he knows he'll be spotted. Then he studies people's reactions. Somebody comes along, it's night, you see something, what is it? What's your reaction to it? Are you frightened by it? Do you investigate it further? How do people react to these phenomena? This very closely relates, of course, to the UFO encounter. Well, I think that worked rather well. After an evening spent in the field, John checks with local law enforcement to see if any unusual sightings were reported. The reports reveal a lot about perception. And in asking some of these people later what they saw, they described things, some of the objects as big as 50 feet in diameter. And this was the hat, without a question. But the heart of Project Strat is the broadcast operation. Every day, John beams two signals out into space. One, a digital pulse code, and the other, a live radio show. These are the bait he uses to try and lure UFOs into the area. There are no sponsors, no commercials, maybe even no listeners. And we wish you a good evening and a good night and peace as always. But just the possibility that something out there might hear and perhaps respond keeps John going. I really believe that in expanding our consciousness, this is part of what we must now deal with. As we've matured and developed technology and have gone outside of our own world, we've also opened up the possibility that there's other intelligences all around us, that there are other life forms out there. Whether they're friendly or hostile, we need to be prepared. We need psychologically and technically to be ready to, to, to confront this or deal with it as it appears, or we may be an extinct species. Seven days a week, 365 days a year, for 22 years. He has no help, and he never calls in sick. The door is always open at Project Strat, 
And John is there, waiting for contact. Yeah, this is Caden. A telephone call from a fellow aviator. Ernie Wilson. And so, for Marty Caden, another investigation begins. There's one thing to remember about this. Pilot Over the years, Marty has cultivated a network of informants, mostly aviators. He never intended to become a father confessor to troubled pilots, but there is no 12-step program for aviators who've seen UFOs. And so, they call him. Which brings us to Marty's newest case. The man who called Marty today is a distinguished aerospace engineer and veteran of NASA's Apollo moon landing team. And in the 1950s, a military aviator with SAC, the Strategic Air Command. During the Cold War, SAC was America's first line of defense. Its bombers were in the air 24 hours a day, loaded with nuclear weapons. Crews were trained to do the unthinkable, knowing they would almost certainly never return. Men the Air Force trusted with America's most precious military secrets. After the Washington wave, it was illegal for a military aviator to publicly discuss UFOs he might have seen. This aviator did his duty, kept his silence, but he can't erase his memories. A long time ago, something happened on a routine training mission in a SAC bomber. Now he's retired. He needs to put to rest something that's still alive in his mind's eye. Something that's been troubling him since the 1950s. It's finally time to go on the record to an investigator and fellow aviator. Marty wants to hear what he has to say, but he's not optimistic about solving this case. It's 40 years old. Where were you when this took place? I would estimate probably around 22,000 feet, perhaps uh, halfway across the Gulf of Mexico. Where were you in the aircraft? What was your position? I was in the right gunner's position. What did you see at first that drew your attention? Well, the first thing that happened was when the radar operator had finished calibrating his system, he had a target at 60 miles. At what point did something come into your visual range and you sighted something? It was less than five seconds after he reported the, the target at one o'clock and five miles. And what caught your attention? I saw a neon blur go by the right side of the aircraft. Knowing the, the your altitude, the position of seeing at what speed would you believe or would you estimate this thing was traveling? The aircraft, uh, the target covered from the 60 mile point until it went by the right side of the aircraft in 45 seconds. 60 miles in 45 seconds. That's correct. At that distance covering 60 miles in 45 seconds, there was no aircraft in the United States arsenal that was capable of such speed? No, sir. Not even the SR-71. So it couldn't be an aircraft that was one of ours? It was definitely not an aircraft. What angle was it climbing at, for example? It was not climbing. Uh, it was either straight and level or in a slight descent. Straight and level? Yes, sir. I would estimate, based on the speed that you could calculate from the elapsed distance in time, that the object was traveling approximately 1.33 miles per second. Uh, Configuration-wise, it was almost impossible to tell what it was. Uh, if anything, it was, uh, every time I think about this, uh, it, a neon tube comes into mind. At what point after the passage of this object past the aircraft, when you still didn't know what the devil it was, were you able to ask the pilots about it? I didn't ask them. I was waiting for them to say something. I don't mean then in the air, but on the ground later. At any time afterward. I never said a word to them. Why? The mindset at that time was one that uh, you would jeopardize your security clearance or stood a chance of jeopardizing your security clearance by talking about something like this. You, it was like you were all maintaining a conspiracy of silence with each other. Memory is a funny thing. In his Air Force career, a strategic air command crewman could spend hundreds of hours in the air. Yet decades later, he finds himself haunted by the memory of an event that lasted barely 60 seconds. Knowing what you do about flying velocity and uh, weaponry, 
What would have happened had that thing hit the aircraft? The aircraft would have been vaporized and it would have been another routine training mission that wound up with a, a missing aircraft and crew. Another sighting that can't be dismissed, but can't be explained. No photographs, no confirmation, and yet whatever it was seems to have been real. Once again, Marty Caden finds himself at a dead end. At any time since this event, have you entertained a possible, have you thought that this object might not have been on this earth? There was never a time that I ever thought that it was of this earth. In 1969, there was a major development in the UFO story in this country, but you probably never heard of it. It involved charges of cover-ups, alleged misuse of federal funds, even a suicide. This story is about the last time our government publicly investigated UFOs. It began with Michigan voters who were not happy with the answers the Air Force was providing to their UFO questions. Gerald Ford, who was congressman at the time and then president, of course, initiated the first congressional hearings that contained portions that were open to the public. Talk about the domestic issues. I think the Congress wanted a fresh look into UFOs, an objective scientific investigation that would be completely independent of the Air Force. In charge was a physicist at the University of Colorado, Dr. Edward Condon. Many people had high hopes that this would finally be an in-depth, serious scientific study. But when the Condon report came out, the UFO community was outraged. We find this Condon report incredible. I would label as prejudiced. Really, it's a lot of nonsense. This report covers only about 3% of the evidence that was made available to them. There is a very large, uh, a very large, an overwhelming majority of the significant case material that has not even been confronted. It evades a number of cases in which the Air Force itself said there was no explanation. Dr. Condon and his group was given an unprecedented opportunity to clarify the UFO problem that's puzzled so many of us for a long time. He wasted that opportunity. And so ended the last public government investigation of UFOs in this country. In 1952, after the Washington wave, the Air Force had classified reports of pilot sightings. In 1969, following the Condon report, the United States Air Force closed Project Blue Book forever. Officially, the government was off the case, but the sightings and the mystery never went away. From that day on, the UFO question was left in the hands of the private citizens. And anyone who wanted to investigate, from respected scientists to unknown civilians, would be on their own. If you're a UFO investigator, finding witnesses is not a problem. They will come to you. Physical evidence might be even more intriguing, if you could find any. You had the flying disks, the daylight disks uh, that we investigated early on. And then you had what they call close encounters of the first kind, where people actually claim to have seen machine-like objects, not something way up in the air, but within 500 feet. And then you had close encounters of the second kind where these objects actually landed and left physical traces behind. Del Norte in the San Luis Valley, Colorado. A little ranching town with a big problem. In this case, there's no shortage of physical evidence. The trouble is, it raises more questions than it answers. A serial killer is on the loose in Del Norte. Something is killing the cows. And strange as it sounds, there are people here who wonder if the mystery is somehow connected with UFOs. No one knows where to turn, so they call the sheriff. The whole chest cavity was taken. Part of the, part of the ribs on one side, or both sides were taken, about 12 ribs. The lungs, the heart, and everything were gone. 
the liver was laying right on the hide part of it, uh, which any any farmer or anybody with any knowledge of animals, uh, a liver from a wild animal like that is a delicacy. When things get this strange, one of the people Sheriff Norton calls is Chris O'Brien. The photographs that I obtained in talking to Chris, it just it didn't look like a normal death to me. Cattle ranchers are used to taking care of their own problems. And you can bet the county undersheriff doesn't call for help unless he's really at a loss. So what does it take to bring local law enforcement, salt-of-the-earth cattle ranchers, and a new-age Sam Spade together? Some pretty high strangeness. Hey, there he is. Bob. Hello, Chris O'Brien. Nice to meet you. This I brought John Har. He's a rancher I told you about. He... Bob, I've heard about you. Yeah. Yeah. I know you from the, the post office. Well, I hear you also had an animal mutilated, huh? Well, we had three killed, four killed, one mutilated. Uh, real strange stuff. I, I still don't know what to think about it perfectly, but yeah, we, we had uh, quite an experience. I, I know before that happened, we didn't even really know what mutilation was and didn't really believe in mutilation, but now, now we believe in mutilation. And that's that. the same way I was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's take a quick hike out there. Now that he's been called in, Chris wants to visit the scene of the crime. These ranchers don't know him, but they're happy to listen to what he has to say. At this point, they'll listen to anybody who might have an answer. Well, the best thing to do is to, is to actually stake it out like with a tarp. And, uh, and leave the animal there? And leave the animal there and then try to get myself or another investigator or law enforcement on site immediately because then we can go ahead and, and not only do an actual crime scene investigation but also obtain fresh forensic samples. In talking with the out, out lying areas and the neighbors and stuff there were lights uh, reported in the treetops uh, would have been just east of where this cow was found the subject that I talked to said that the lights were down low it gave the appearance of a vehicle parked on top of the on top of the hill but anybody that knows there's no roads up there he said that this this light came above treetop level and then elongated out into a into a bar type light this is, this is where I found the calf, okay. right in this little depression, and he was facing to the north and with the feet back this direction. What struck me about it is the eyes were cut out in a perfect circle in one ear, mm -hmm. and you noticed that, and then yeah. the way the brain was removed from the skull and, and yeah. uh, so cleanly, and the skull was skinned back halfway on the forehead, not totally. It, it almost looked like to me they didn't finish it, started on it, got interrupted, didn't finish. Uh, one, one of the things I noticed was the lack of blood or the lack of a fatal type of injury on the four cattle we lost. I didn't notice so much the smell or anything, but just the lack of a cause of death. Nobody's really sure what's going on in this valley, but whatever it is, they don't like it. Right across the county you have Rio Grande County, then you have Alamosa County, and then you have uh, Huerfano County. And the sheriff over there was never, never a believer in uh, cattle mutilation until he went out and, and started looking at it. They'd do a, a, an autopsy and go ahead and slice the heart open and find dust in the heart where the blood should be. When they did dirt samples, the dirt didn't match with the samples located where the cow was, was actually lying. So it, it, you know, he's a believer now. If whatever is killing these cattle is not of this earth, then where is it from? And what does it want? Are close encounters of the second kind occurring in the mysterious valley? What's missing here isn't physical evidence. It's answers. Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a thousand miles away. It's the end of a shift at the Harley-Davidson Motorcycle Factory. For most of these people, their work is done until tomorrow. For one of them, his work is just beginning. Tim Hildebrandt runs a precision gear grinding machine here at Harley-Davidson. He used to live in the biker's work. Before I was in the UFOs, I, I guess I was just a, a motorcycle person, I, working for Harley-Davidson. I've always enjoyed riding Harley Davidsons. I was a motorcycle person. Tim still rides the bike, still wears the clothes, 
But a few years ago, the road he was following took a very different turn. In 1989, on September 10th, was the first time I ever saw one. It was um, as I was leaving work about 7.05. I saw it off to the west, and it was a very, very prominent uh, cigar-shaped silver object. That was the first sighting I ever had. The following years, when I started taking pictures. If the ultimate goal of the UFO investigator is to uncover evidence, Tim Hildebrandt believes no evidence could be more compelling than a photograph. A photograph makes one person's perception tangible for the whole world to see. For the last six years, Tim has spent every free moment and every last dollar investigating UFOs through photography. Over the past five years, total investment, I would imagine anywhere between twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars would be a, would be a good guess. I mean, you're talking the cost of all the film and all the developing. Tim's goal is to gather hard evidence to document the sightings he and others have experienced. He's grown particularly interested in a small town a few hours away called Dundee, where UFO sightings and other strangeness have become almost commonplace. The people at Dundee, a lot of them have seen UFOs. Um, some of them have seen them close. Um, um, there has been a lot of things happening out there. There's, there's been some very unusual circles um, out there. Um, people have uh, heard things. I'm out there recording it as much as I can. Tim's destination is a bar up in Dundee called Benson's Hideaway. It's a gathering place for anyone who's seen something in the sky they can't explain. He told me, and I, I kind of, I'm really into this stuff. I believe in UFOs. You couldn't throw a stone in this place without hitting a UFO believer. I know there's other life forms out there than, than us. So. There's a lot of people in the area that have sighted something, seen something, felt something and had no place to tell about it. So they gather here at Benson's to share their UFO experiences. Tim's contribution is evidence. Photographs of his own sightings, many of them taken from the summit of Dundee Mountain, only a few miles away. And he said all of a sudden he heard like it sounded like a jet fly over by. Ten seconds later went flying back. Hi, Bill. Hi, Tim. In this place, Tim's photographs are seen as an important body of work. Many of these people wish they had photographs that could prove their own sightings were real. Tim's pictures have captured what he believes is a significant clue in the UFO mystery. Triangles. What's unique about that triangle shape is that uh, it, it seems to be um, occurring in more photographs that I've taken. Um, in this particular photograph here, um, there's a triangle outline at the lower right of this light that's, that's it's quite obviously uh, there, and you can, you can see that it has three sides. Other people around the country have reported triangular sightings, but they are unusual. The real excitement this weekend is about something that happened one night earlier in the month in a marshy area of the lake. Strange lights, loud noises, and in the morning an ominous sight hundreds of square feet of crushed and flattened reeds. It looked like something had landed, actually, and that's where the grass grew there. Now, everyone's wondering, did something from out there touch down here in Dundee? In my opinion, they didn't land long enough to burn. He walked to the edge, he walked to the edge, and he said, this will be the real test. And he walked off, and he sunk down into it, down to about middle of his knee. And it was just that. When I made a believer, I just was like, oh my God, he's walking on water. And it came real loud and close, and zoom, it was far away, and then all of a sudden, zoom, it jetted over the marsh. If one person sees something in the sky, they could be mistaken. But in this case, there were scores of witnesses all over town. Unfortunately, Tim wasn't there that night to photograph the lights. The only physical evidence that remains is the mysterious imprint in the reeds, left by something. Um, our son Andy had an interest um, based on a couple of experiences that he talked about. 
and um, I noticed this in a flyer. Not everyone here is local. On the edge of the action, there's a family that traveled down from Green Bay. They look a little out of place in this crowd, but one of them feels right at home. I was seeing UFOs. There's something wrong with this picture of a perfect American family. Little Andy's been seeing things. Mom is sympathetic. Sis is a bit skeptical. And Dad's downright confused. It was a triangle. It had three lights. They were round. And it kind of, um, like, swerved. And it shot down the sky until it disappeared. Triangular. The same unusual shapes that Tim has photographed. The moment Andy saw Tim's photos, he knew the trip from Green Bay was well worth it. The big event that caps the day is a hike up Dundee Mountain with Tim in the lead. Most of these people at least once have seen or heard something in the sky that they couldn't explain. Tonight, they'll have a chance to see how one investigator goes about gathering evidence. Here we are. We're going to use the 400, hopefully. Give us a little more telephoto range. Tripod is your best friend, because when you're making exposures in low light, you got to keep the camera dead, set, dead steady. And if you don't, you're not going to get a sharp picture. And you got to always keep them ready, because you don't know when it's going to happen. You don't even know if it's going to happen. You don't even know. You might come up here five or six times and nothing will happen. You got to be ready all the time. When a person has a UFO sighting, they have to make a choice. They can ignore what they've seen as if it never happened. Or they can accept it. But with something as strange as a UFO, human nature makes it hard to believe even our own eyes without physical evidence. to science but the philosopher William James said our science is but a drop our ignorance a sea faced with questions that have no answers the UFO investigator is left to wonder and to speculate part scientist part dreamer part detective these citizens seek knowledge wherever they can find it Tim Hildebrandt believes the UFO mystery goes back to ancient times by reading all these different books, the Bible, um, many, many old books, um, it's obvious that we've had visitors all along. And the picture was that we have been visited throughout history. And we still are being visited now. Whether UFOs are an ancient presence or a modern phenomenon is only one question. Even if we knew that answer, we still would wonder, what are they? And why do people keep seeing them? At a convention center in Arkansas, scores of ufologists have gathered to compare clues and trade theories. Among those making an appearance is Chris O'Brien. He's traveled a long way. There are fellow investigators here, and Chris wants to bring them up to date on his latest case. Hey, there he is. How you doing, huh? All right, all right. Good to see you, man. So you didn't get abducted this time? No, I didn't all get right. abducted this time. Go. This is the strangest mm. case I personally have seen, and one of the strangest I've ever heard about. What all's missing? <laughs> this is uh, like about everything. Well, uh, not quite. Some of the things that should be missing are there, and things that normally are there are missing. Um, but this thing is huge. Chris has also brought videotape of a very unusual sighting. Objects milling around like they were searching for something there was no real pattern to their movement and they all swore up and down that they don't fly at night in the valley and and for chris it's a rare opportunity to get some feedback from others in his field and to try out hypotheses about what ufos are and where they might come from where do they come from uh, people like Dr. J. Allen Hynek started out, like myself, feeling that we're dealing with nuts and bolts spacecraft coming from another solar system, another star system, perhaps. But as time went by, there are some very bizarre things that UFOs do that seem to indicate that this might not be so. For example, you might have a radar visual sighting where you see a, a UFO at point A, 
and instead of traveling from A to B like this, it might just disappear and appear over here. So some of us began to think that maybe we're dealing with something that is able to penetrate our dimension from another dimension that can take on uh, material uh, aspects here but actually disappear and go somewhere else enabling them perhaps to uh, bypass what we call the uh, laws of physics. And lift off, lift off of the first operational space shuttle mission. When the Hubble telescope started to send back pictures from deep space, Marty Caden finally had a fresh lead to work with. In effect, the Hubble Space Telescope is a time machine. Because it can see so much farther out than we can here on Earth, it's taking us back into the distant past. Now the Hubble telescope, by looking as far back in time as it has, 14 billion years, has shown us vast changes in the universe that we never even suspected before. 95% of everything we believed is now in a trash can. Marty's been writing a book about Hubble, attempting to make sense of what it's starting to reveal. The Hubble findings have Marty thinking about UFOs in a whole new way. Now he's moving beyond pilot sightings and consulting with astronomers and astrophysicists about clues of an entirely different nature. Clues like black holes that challenge our very notions of time, space, gravity, the constants that define our existence, or so we thought. And if we can discover what time is and gravity is, we're going to find them all linked together like an orchestra playing the same tune, but in different notes, different sounds, different levels. And that's what our universe is. It's an orchestration. It all adds up to this. Maybe they're not out there at all. Maybe somehow they're right here, alongside us, in a parallel universe. Hubble is suggesting that there are other dimensions beyond those we understand. It doesn't mean that they're traveling through space like we a rocket from here to the moon like Apollo did, uh, did or uh, any ship like that. These could have the ability to transfer from one time dimension to another. It's a shortcut from one point of our, our space or our universe to another one. Like a tear in a fabric of a drape that makes up time. If there are such things as disks that are maneuvered by intelligent beings, if they have only a century more of learning than we do, that might be an easy trip for them to make. Now consider that above all. If they have only one more century of science and learning than we do here on Earth, we would be primitives to them. Hubble has given Marty the most compelling new evidence he's seen in years. He hasn't been this excited since he first learned to fly. In October 1993, Congress cut the funding and pulled the plug on NASA's SETI project. The amendment I am offering today will eliminate funding for what I believe to be a foolish and wasteful NASA program, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI. The best minds in science had said it was worth doing. It is now okay to talk about life elsewhere, or intelligent life elsewhere. That we might just find uh, signals from other civilizations. Life must exist in the universe, and it must exist quite abundantly. If we had made contact with other intelligent life, it would be the greatest event in human history. But there was no money in it. And even the best minds in science have to eat. So when the last government paycheck was cashed, they packed their bags and moved on. And who of us wouldn't do the same? Anybody with any equipment anywhere with the right way of looking can find it. Well, hi, Spray. Come on in. Fine, thank you. It's been a little bit since I've seen you. 
Looking for life elsewhere in the universe isn't easy. NASA's search for extraterrestrial intelligence and John Shepard's Project Strat both hit the same rock in the road. Money. As far as making a living here or making money doing this, no. Now this is a copy mm. of what I've sent out to uh, the National Magazine Real Estate Today oh, for the, the most unusual listing contest. I've run out of resources and I've had to mortgage my dream here. I've had to practically sell the, well, I am. I am selling the house and the project. Well, I think as far as the price for the land and, and the property, it's, it's right up there in, with the rate of what's going on around waterfront. You know, we maybe could work on a little bit of a price reduction if you'd like to maybe generate some new activity on it. We could see about doing something like that since we haven't gotten a lot of walkthroughs or anything. I don't think we've had any. As far as lowering the price on the equipment, I, I, I find that a little, a little hard to accept, especially since there's been 22 years put into this. I really would like to at least make more than five bucks an hour for all the years I put into it. I'm lucky to pull down 450 a month. I'm doing real good if I, I can generate that kind of income. And that's not from the UFO-related things. That's, that's from my own business ventures and my own efforts, contract-related. Uh, I do not have uh, any investments hardly left. I used to be in the stock market, made good money there for a while, and invested it into the instruments in this lab and this facility. Sure did. So now, after 22 years, John is selling his dream, ending his search. The questions Project Strat has been investigating are still unanswered. It's a painful decision. I love the work. The work is, is my life. But money is real, and you have to have it to pursue a dream. It doesn't just happen. As far as the equipment goes, John, I mean... But I feel that we did accomplish some things. I don't think it was a lost cause. I don't think we wasted our time or our energy. I think there's some good stuff that's been contributed for, to the Center for UFO Studies to move on to the symposiums, to other people that are involved in the research. John hopes to find a buyer who shares his passion to know what's out there someone else who dreams the dream of contact someone who will assume the burden of running project strat year in and year out but he knows the chances of that are pretty slim there are many who give lip service to the dream but few indeed who are willing to pay the personal price of dedicating their lives to its pursuit The price one pays for investigating UFOs can sometimes be more than 22 years of time spent searching and not finding. There are those who believe that pursuing the UFO question may have cost physicist Dr. James McDonald his career, and perhaps more. Dr. James McDonald was a good example of what ridicule can do to uh, people who are involved with UFO research, especially if they have credentials devoted a good part of his life to investigating uh, UFO reports, sightings, writing them up, speaking at scientific and non-scientific uh, groups all over the country and in different parts of the world. Another thing that's common all over the world is the scoffing and ridicule from official sources, from my fellow scientists, largely, well, almost entirely. He was respected by uh, UFO researchers, but his peers sort of looked askance at what he was doing. When he was a, uh, a witness or giving testimony at congressional hearings on uh, what the SST, the supersonic transport, might do to the ozone layer, one of the congressmen uh, brought up the fact that he was interested in UFOs and researching UFOs and sort of made a fool out of this uh, very brilliant man. No one can say with certainty what it was that finally broke James McDonald's spirit. But the ridicule he endured for taking UFOs seriously cannot have helped him in his struggle with his own personal demons. In the early morning of June 13, 1971, Dr. James McDonald walked into the Arizona desert. An hour before dawn, he put a gun to his head and ended his life. Dr. James McDonald, 
a ghostly presence who stands at the door to the UFO mystery, greeting us with this reminder. Beware all those who enter here. So have you gone through one of these hazardous events? What is it that's your experience? You know, there would be episodes of, of anxiety or things like that at night, uh, night terrors, if you will. A support group somewhere in the Midwest. These people have gathered with their therapists to talk about a problem they all share, something they can't discuss anywhere else. Some have traveled hundreds of miles to be here. They're not talking about relationships, alcohol, abuse, or any of the other issues that concern most support groups. They're talking about alien abduction. I heard a voice say, Francis, we want you. And I can remember being so scared that I was cowered right down to the floor. Alien abduction. Some believe that the twisting trail of UFO clues ultimately leads to this. For those who are convinced it is happening to them, there is no escape. Perhaps because these people feel powerless to resist. They go to extraordinary lengths to accept it, even make peace with it. Learning to become more and more comfortable with them and... I no longer feel poked and prodded and abused. I feel participation on a certain level and the fear is disappearing. I'm starting to make peace with the experiences that I'm having and they do let me know that they care about me, that they are kind and gentle and loving, which is sometimes hard to imagine. But there is one man here who cannot accept what's happening. To him, the experience is a nightmare, and he thinks the others in the group are rationalizing, deceiving themselves when they call it a positive experience. This man is a medical doctor, a scientist like James McDonald. He has nowhere else to turn, since most scientists don't even want to discuss UFOs. But the talk here isn't making him feel much better. Before, most of you folks have said how wonderful the experience is, and yet you talk about trauma and terror at the same time. I don't feel like I'm the victim anymore in this. I feel like it's something where I'm growing and I'm becoming a better person for it. Right, but it could still be, you know, you could have a healthy reaction to an adverse, This man of uh, science knows all too well the lesson of James McDonald. If any of his peers overheard him talking seriously about UFOs, he would lose his professional reputation and credibility. So he refuses to reveal his identity. The people in this support group at least take him seriously. But it's their positive view of the subject that bothers him. Take a lab rat, you know, he, he spends his life in a cage and then he dies for some medical experiment to advance, what, humanity? I mean, the same scenario could be for some other alien intelligence using us in much the same way. I like not to think that way, but... This UFO investigator is compelled by more than curiosity. His motivation is fear. In his case, he is not only the investigator, he is also the victim. To add to his problems, the evidence exists only in his mind. He's well aware that this makes him hard to believe. Close encounters of the fourth kind, where people are actually abducted, we felt that these people were crackpots. I said, how can these nice people uh, lie with such straight faces? And we felt that it, it, was, it just couldn't be. It just couldn't be. So it took a long time for UFO researchers like myself to come to the conclusion that these things are really happening. The man we call Dr. X has no doubt that something really is happening. These people have flashbacks or dreams or partial memories of a UFO abduction experience. They're troubled, they don't know where to go. I went to the encounter group hoping to find people like myself, perhaps with a similar background that I could identify with that have shared something similar. I seem to not be well received by the other members of the group so consequently i feel every bit if not more so isolated when i go to the support group meeting uh, as i do in my workplace people at work unless you selectively screen who you're talking to for the most part don't want to hear about it my wife does not want to hear about it whatsoever four years of college business school medical school a doctor trained in the scientific method he functions in a rational, tangible world of measurements, tests, controls, results. 
He's used to having the answer. Typically, people that are scientists, or at least have a science background, are not at all receptive to this phenomenon. I really believe that it makes them feel uneasy to even possibly contemplate that it might, there might be something to it. This man of science is haunted by an experience he had 20 years ago, an experience science cannot explain. On a routine drive, several hours of his life disappeared. To this day, he's not sure what happened. His fraternity brother and I were in graduate school in Michigan, and we were returning to our undergraduate fraternity in Virginia. We uh, left Ann Arbor in the afternoon. We took back roads, which is something that I have not done before that time or after. And we got into Ohio. It was dark, early evening. We tried to get back on the, the interstate, the Ohio Turnpike. We drove towards it and ended up on a body of water. It must have been like Erie. It was a desolate area. There was nothing there but a, the end of the road and a street light. Got back in the car, headed back for the interstate, discovered to our dismay that the road we were on had no entrance ramp to the interstate. That's it. That's the last thing either one of us remember. It's now just before dawn. We're traveling on Interstate 81. We've just crossed into Virginia, across the state line. And we both, at the same time, are emerging to wakefulness. Neither one of us knows who drove the last several hundred miles. Neither one of us has any recollection of what happened. But something did happen, and somewhere buried in his subconscious for the last 20 years are the memories that can tell the tale. The mystery of that missing time has tormented Dr. X, growing worse with each passing year. Now he has reached the point where he can no longer go on not knowing. His search for answers to the UFO question is about to take him into the hidden universe of his own mind. For the last 20 years, Dr. X has been troubled by strange, hazy memories of something that happened on a long drive during graduate school. His memory is unclear, but one thing stands out vividly. A gap of several hours missing from his mind. The typical benchmark of UFO abduction cases uh, we call missing time. Missing time, a contradiction that defies logic. No one knows that better than a man of science. We went from west of Cleveland to Virginia, and neither one of us knows who drove. Our consciousness ends and begins at the same two points, uh, with no explanation. The people are going to see, say, where have you been, you know, at such and such a time, and they look at their watch and see there's maybe two hours missing. If we did fall asleep, we should have been on the side of the road, crashed into a tree, or had some sort of memory, but we have neither. We just safely found ourselves waking up at the same moment, hundreds of miles away from where we last remembered anything. Hours of time, hundreds of miles, gone without a trace. Impossible, and yet it was all too real. Somewhere buried deep in his subconscious was a memory so horrifying that his conscious mind refused to allow it in. I was morbidly depressed for quite a while afterwards and was at a loss to explain why. I slept easily 12 to 14 hours a day and had an abrupt change in my, my habits that I couldn't account for. To the UFO investigator, missing time is like the tip of an iceberg. It points to the existence of crucial clues hidden beneath the surface of the mind. What is needed is a tool for retrieving those missing memories. Hypnosis. When you have someone who has suffered a traumatic experience, whether it's shell shock or something very, very traumatic, the loss of a loved one, something that's so awful that they've buried it in the unconscious portion of their mind, I think hypnosis is very, very valuable. Uh, and it opens the doors for these things to come out. But with this warning, 
that the strange things that you do remember that give you so much trouble now might be multiplied tenfold if you really did have a UFO abduction experience and all these things become part of your conscious memory it would be like opening Pandora's box you'll have more questions for which there are no answers I decided that I would undergo hypnosis to see if I could under uncover particularly what occurred uh, that on that trip uh, when I was in graduate school in 1975 and so he took a chance and opened Pandora's box Sure enough, under hypnosis, I did have recollections that I didn't have consciously that only further supported, yes, something did happen. Sometimes it takes two or three sessions to get that traumatic experience to come from the unconscious mind to the conscious mind. Again, it might just come out the first session. At the first session, I had nothing more than a, a physical reaction. I laid on the chair and I started tremoring. Horrendously, to the view of resembled a seizure. In my mind's eye, I had the almond eyes of an alien in front of me. I couldn't break through that at a subsequent hypnosis session. My mind stopped on that incident in graduate school. And that street light at the end of the road by the water is not a street light at all, it's a light on the underside of a craft. I went back a second time. And he regressed me further into my childhood since we didn't seem to be able to get past that particular block. Sure enough, I'm in my elementary school playground. An enormous darkness covered the, the field. It was like an eclipse, and the storm clouds moved over very rapidly. There was maybe a half dozen to eight of us that were running for cover, thinking that there was going to be a bad storm or something. I thought that, you know, sure enough, I got home, you know, the storm came and so forth. But under hypnosis, I... I didn't make it to cover. I'm seemingly stationary in the field, and out of the class descends a craft, a typical disc-shaped, saucer-shaped vehicle. A ramp descends from the underside of it. It appears to be an entity, kind of shuffles down, and, and that's all I wanted to remember. Perhaps knowing is better than not knowing, but whatever comfort his new knowledge has given Dr. X, it has also raised new fears. Uh, I never used to pay attention to the sky. And suddenly, uh, the sky is intimidating. I constantly am scanning the sky. Nightmarish memories from his own childhood are bad enough. But even worse is the possibility that the experience may be repeated with his wife and young children. Like many ufologists, Dr. X has come to believe that alien abduction runs in families. Case after case, we have females where it seems that ova is being taken. We have other cases where fetuses seem to be taken from women who are used as surrogate mothers. We're talking about what looks like a genetic engineering interest or program. I'm scared for my kids, but there's precious little I can do to help them. It's created some tense feelings between my wife and myself. I say, if it's happening to me, there's a good chance that it's going to happen to our children. This makes her extremely uneasy to the point of we've terminated some uh, evening dinners rather early on some bad terms. A man who appears to have everything in life is tormented by a mystery that began with a strange light in the night sky. And he is not alone. For every story we have heard of a sighting or a slip in time, there are thousands more. Is it all real? Is any of it real? Are these strange tales the product of hallucination, deception, or something else. The UFO mystery continues to confound us, and even those who might prefer to dismiss the question, sooner or later find a clue they cannot ignore. On August 7, 1996, the scientists at NASA announced they had found just such a clue. But we're here today 
to provide exciting scientific findings and to lay out compelling clues that lead us to the direction that we think life might have existed at some point on Mars. Is there life out there? The search for answers to the UFO question continues. because they believe they are the objects of otherworldly interest. They are convinced that something not of this earth has abducted them. Their story starts with a sighting. A huge sphere of light. I mean, it was gigantic. It was the size of a two-story house. Then, hours vanished from their lives, missing time. My next conscious memory was landing very hard in the vehicle on the road as if i'd been dropped from above i'm missing about an hour and a half that i could not account for these events have plunged them into a mystery that has interrupted their lives forcing them to dig for answers to questions beyond our imagination my first question was is it possible for people to be kidnapped by a ufo but the deeper they go into the mystery the more questions they raise. So they turn to UFO investigators. I get hundreds of reports each year from people just crying out for help. Searching their past, they have come to the terrifying conclusion that they have been followed since childhood. Ray asked if there was anything strange about our childhood. It was more like what wasn't strange about our childhood. <laughs> To unlock buried memories, they have turned to hypnosis and uncovered a possibility they find difficult to accept, yet impossible to dismiss. Alien abduction. Now they are haunted by the only conclusion they can draw. Their lives will never be the same. But this man's story has just begun. Like the others, he has experienced missing time. But unlike them, he has not yet attempted to delve into his subconscious to retrieve the hidden memories, because he fears what he might find. I want to know, but I don't want to know. I, it could help me. It could utterly shatter me. Maybe he just lost track of time. Or maybe like these others, he will conclude that he has been abducted. As this night falls, they will all tell their stories. The UFO experience as they perceive it. Perhaps they are victims of a mass delusion. Or perhaps they herald the next chapter in a bizarre tale that's haunted civilization throughout history. No one knows how this story ends. But if what these people believe is true, it will be the greatest revelation ever told and forever change life as we know it. Are we alone in the universe? It's one of the greatest mysteries of all time. For eons, humans have seen things in the sky and wondered, is someone coming? The story of UFOs is unending, and it grows stranger with each decade. And in the last 30 years, there has been a riveting new twist. Alien abduction. Abduction. It's the most bizarre and unsettling wrinkle in the UFO mystery. No one knows exactly how many people claim to have been abducted, but the number has grown steadily larger in the years since the first reports began to surface. Betty and Barney Hill, one of the first classic abduction cases. In the early 1960s, the couple, a social worker and a mailman, reported being followed by an aircraft while traveling in New Hampshire one night. They saw a bright light and realized afterward they could not account for two missing hours. At first they tried to ignore the event, 
Then Betty began to have terrifying nightmares. Buried in her subconscious were memories of being taken aboard an alien ship and examined. Most people who heard of the case were unwilling to journey into such bizarre territory. But defense analyst Raymond Fowler and astronomer Dr. J. Allen Hynek heard the Hill's account personally. Both men were scientifically minded and considered themselves skeptics. But they were about to undergo a transformation of their beliefs. A transformation so profound that each would eventually become a legendary UFO investigator. I remember I listened to the Hills give their testimony before they were investigated. And they gave it to a small group. And I was sitting there with a fellow investigator looking at these people and we sort of looked at each other and I said, how can these nice people uh, lie with such straight faces? And we felt that it, it, was, it just couldn't be. It just couldn't be. But they, they earnestly and fully believed that this happened to them. And certainly something did happen to them. But whether it was an actual physical case of abduction, we just don't know. But reports from seemingly credible sources kept coming in. Reports that all carried the same benchmarks. Someone sees a bright light in the sky. It overtakes them. The next thing they know, hours have vanished from their life. They try to ignore the incident, but find themselves haunted by bizarre nightmares or strange childhood memories. If we only had one or two cases uh, where people have relived complementary abduction experiences with the same benchmarks, uh, we may say this is a remarkable coincidence. But we have hundreds of people who go through the same experience, sometimes in the same order, seeing the same things. Well, I had a UFO sighting yesterday. I don't know who else to call, but I've been familiar with your work for years. Yes, it's not something and as the number of reported cases has grown, so too has public interest in the strange phenomenon of UFOs. Today, more and more people, like Ray Fowler and the late Dr. Hynek, feel compelled to investigate the question of alien abduction. Now retired from the defense contracting business, Ray devotes much of his free time to investigating and then publishing abduction reports. There's no shortage of work. People keep turning to him for help. These people have flashbacks or dreams or partial memories of a UFO abduction experience. They're trouble, they don't know where to go, they try to talk to their friends, their ministers and so forth, and no one really will listen to them. And they come and they ask me to listen and I listen. Sometimes Ray launches a full-scale investigation, attempting to uncover what happened during an episode of Missing Time. Ray did just that when Jim Weiner approached him for help. Jim didn't know it yet, but he and his twin brother Jack had become part of the next chapter in the UFO story, the chapter on alien abduction. The people you're about to meet once led normal lives, but something interrupted those lives. They believe they've been abducted by otherworldly beings. Ray's investigations have so overtaken his life that he must now force himself to make time for his family, his garden, and this homemade planetarium. But one case held so many clues to the abduction mystery that he could not turn away. Ray calls it the Allagash abduction. The Wieners were very interesting because here we have identical twins. Jim and Jack Wiener, identical twins, as close as brothers can be. They came from the same egg. They finish each other's sentences. Both are artists and both believe they've been abducted. Abducted because they are twins. They like to think of themselves as pretty average guys. Jim teaches computer art and lives in the city with his fiance. Jack is also an artist. He works as an optical machinist and lives in the country with his wife, Mary. Identical twins. Some UFO investigators suspect a link between twins and abduction. If you wanted to study the human animal, you might find twins to be especially interesting specimens. 
If you look at the UFO abduction phenomenon as a whole, you'll see that there seems to be a tremendous interest in the reproductive systems of human males and human females. So looking at it from a human point of view, what better subjects would you have for genetic engineering or genetic experience than to examine twins, especially identical twins? Abduction was not a word in the Wiener's everyday vocabulary 20 years ago. I've always considered myself um, a, a fairly normal type guy, you know. Just Mary and I living our lives, you know, working every day, going through the same thing, and no trauma in our lives or anything. That world ended abruptly one summer night on a camping trip with their friend Charlie Foltz. Following their trip, the style and theme of their artwork suddenly took a radical and decidedly strange turn. They began having bizarre nightmares and found themselves overwhelmed with inexplicable fear. It seemed that something terrifying had occurred. But what was it? All that was clear was they could lose their work, their families, even their sanity, if they didn't uncover what had happened. With Ray Fowler's help, they undertook an investigation. It raised an unnerving possibility that they had never considered. Alien abduction. It, it takes a long time to get used to the, to the idea of all of this. It wasn't something I, I found easy to cope with at first. There was a lot of feelings of uncertainty. Am I crazy? Is this some kind of physiological disease? Do I have a tumor in my head? Today we're going to be working with images that use light and shadow uh, to create a mysterious mood. I like to tell people that it never really bothers me and it's always at the, at the, the backmost section of, of my mind. It's kind of a very mysterious setting, but in fact it's um, fairly upfront in my mind every day of my life. We don't know if she's running from somebody. We don't... This is something I have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis day-to-day -day basis. Imagine telling your fiancé, your parents, your boss, that you believe you were abducted. Jim has no illusions about what's at stake. While his fiancé graciously allowed filming in her home, she will not appear on camera. Yeah, my fiancé, um, she tries to stay out of this as much as possible. And I think, um, you know, she's partially frightened about this whole thing because here she is, she's in love, she's going to marry this guy who claims these very bizarre things are happening to him, which are way out of normal. And, um, you know, so it makes her wonder whether her fiancé is all there. And that's frightening for her. And if, if she accepts it, then she has to worry about these things coming for her. I mean, when they come for me, she's here too. But what things? Who is coming? And what do they want? Jim needs to know. We're not doing this to uh, entertain people. We're not doing this for 15 minutes of fame on television. I mean, we're doing this because we want to find answers. When Ray offered to investigate their case, Jim and Jack knew that it wouldn't be a cure for whatever is happening to them. But perhaps having some answers is better than none at all. This is horse country. Appearances are everything, and tradition is king. It's a world of money, power, and influence. The perfect setting for a soap opera. But behind the gates of one horse farm, a story is unfolding that's more like the Twilight Zone than days of our lives. Claire and Diana, complete strangers until eight years ago, or so they thought. When Diana hired Claire to manage the horse farm, they both thought their meeting was just a happy business deal. Claire was a skilled equestrian and trainer who needed work. Diana was trying to hold down a full-time job with the Forest Service and run the farm at the same time. But now they believe there was nothing chance about their meeting. Now they believe it was arranged. They are convinced that they were originally brought together in childhood as part of a bizarre alien experiment and then reunited as adults. I, I can't believe how you came to the farm. Yeah, it was coincidence. That had to be arranged. Um, so because of everything, I was totally out of character. Claire was living a comfortable life hundreds of miles from Diana's farm. She had a good job, an ordinary lifestyle. 
Then one day she left it all behind for no apparent reason, just a feeling. Uh, I had a very stable life. Although I was divorced, I raised my son alone. Um, it, we had a normal lifestyle. Uh, I'd worked very hard to get my home, and I had my rose gardens, and, and everything was the way I wanted. I had a really good job that I'd had for years and was making a, a reasonable income. But something mysterious caused Claire to pick up and leave everything she'd worked for. Uh, one day I woke up, got halfway to work, pulled off on the exit ramp, much too early, turned around, drove home, called the office, resigned. Within two weeks, I was out of the house with what I could stuff in the back of my car, and I drove out of there with no idea where I was headed. Uh, I left everything. I left everything I had worked all my life for. This was just about the time Diana needed a new farm manager. I was desperate. I'd had three or four people come out and interview for the job, but it wasn't quite what I wanted. We weren't compatible somehow and uh, got this call from Claire. She showed up a couple hours later. Then began for both women the strange feeling that they had somehow met before. It was almost like I knew her. Um, I walked her around the farm, showed her what was happening, and always in the back of my mind was, I really met this person someplace before. I hired her. She moved in the next day, started managing the farm, and that was eight years ago. Claire's job included room and board, so she moved on to the farm with Diana and Diana's brother and sister. Claire and Diana soon parlayed their sense of deja vu into a strong friendship and settled down to a horse-based routine. Our lives were, were relatively normal. We had, you know, ups and downs, uh, good times, you know, some not-so-good times, but things went on pretty well. We were just normal, everyday people. Business as usual was interrupted when bizarre events plunged Claire and Diana headlong into a search for answers that ended in one word, abduction. Since then, they've been living a nightmare. There's days that I have that I'm not even convinced it's really happening, that it's really a dream. But then again, I think back, and, and dreams don't leave blood on the pillow. Le leaves in the bed. <laughs> dreams don't do that. Um, so, in my mind, I know it's not a dream. I wish I were making it up. But most days, I know I'm not. It's not like you can go to the police, you can't call 911, you can't get help. Um, you can't even help yourself. You can't fight back. Get mad. Go on. Okay, that's better. Pull him up and take charge. You're letting him just fly through your hands and you are the one in charge. The control is very important to me. Um, I need control in, in this reality because I have none of it with them. You need a little more contact with him. He's still running through your hands. He's running through your legs. I've been that way all my life. And I had always assumed that those personality traits had more to do with me just as a person. You are the boss, not the horse. Than something that may in fact have come in a response to what has happened to me throughout my life. They know some people wish they wouldn't talk about it. Claire works hard to protect her family's privacy. Diana's family refuses to appear, and they would prefer she didn't either. It's, it's been tough for them, almost as tough for them as, as it is for us, because they don't understand what's going on. Um, they don't want to believe we're crazy, but they've known us all our lives. And going, But this person isn't known for telling tales. They're not prone to making things up. You know, they don't lie. But Claire and Diana know that some people think they do lie, and some think they're crazy. But there are many others who stand by them. Let me come here about eight years, maybe a little longer. Well, I have no problem at all with these people. If I did, I wouldn't come here, because I can stay busy. I'm a real good horseshoer, lady. I'm sure it's hurt their business. There's no way it could have helped their business, because people don't want 
to come where they think that there's aliens that are getting the people. It just makes common sense. You know, they don't bother me. They don't bother my kid. My little girl comes here, and we like them. So you know, I don't have any problem with it. But I don't think they were real smart to come forward with this, very honestly. But come forward they have with the whole story. This man, too, has had his life interrupted, derailed by a strange encounter with a bright light in the sky. His name is Fred, and like the others in our story, he suffers from the mysterious malady known as missing time. But unlike them, Fred is not yet convinced that he was abducted. Until now, he has hesitated to explore his missing time because he fears what his hidden memories may reveal. Unit 5 is clear on Meyer Street, en route to Woodstock Hill. If you had told me a year ago that I'd be driving a cab in northeastern Connecticut, I, I never would have believed it. Fred is, or was, a comedian. A rising star in the world of comedy. Working at the biggest clubs in the northeast with some of the best in the business. I'd been doing comedy for several years and I was working five and six nights a week. My career was blossoming. It was, I'd been named the funniest comic in Boston a few years before that. Fred was playing the loser and it was taking him straight to the top. One of the best in town. He's one of the kings of comedy. Headlining all around the country. He's very funny and soon to be your friend. Please welcome. Put your hands together. A nice round of applause for the comedy of Simply Fred. Simply Fred. 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 Get the impression my gynecologist is ripping me off. <laughs> there were the good times growing up. You know, my father used to throw me up in the air, run. <laughs> when I was 15, I quit school and I ran away from home on the advice of my guidance counselor. Never cook bacon in the noon. <laughs> Don't mess up your whole weekend. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Fred won the week-long comedy riot in 1985, beating 200 other comics, including Jim Carrey. I was working with lots of people who, you know, their careers blossomed. And, you know, I'd been at it for quite a few years and was ready to, to make the move into a, a headliner status. And, then this happened, and now I'm here in the quiet corner of Connecticut. But it's not just Fred's career that's on hold. Since the night of missing time, everything that's happened has taken a toll on his relationship with his fiancée, Nina. At one point, she made me stop talking about it completely, I, which was not good for me. I mean, I couldn't... It's something I have to examine, and yet, if I'm forbidden to talk about it, uh, where do I go? What do I do? Uh, she's finally agreed that I could examine it. And examine it, he will. Fred is about to dive headlong into the mystery of his missing time. He prays that he makes it back with his sanity intact and his world restored. The clock measures out a moment, then another, and another, and so defines our lives. But what if time jumped, stopped, restarted, without warning, without pattern? That's the chaos of the missing time experience. For those who experience it, missing time is more than a mystery. It's a problem, a red warning light on the dashboard of the mind that says something is wrong that cannot be ignored. Whatever went wrong for Jim, Jack, and their friend Charlie, it started on a camping trip in the North Woods. My twin 
brother Jack and I and two of our friends uh, went on a camping trip and canoe trip uh, to Baxter State Park in northern Maine. It's up way up in the middle of the Northwoods wilderness. Once you get to Telos Lake, you have to wait for the, the ranger to come and he signs you in. We had planned on going uh, trout fishing at this one pond called Smith Pond. And when he saw that that was on our itinerary, he told us that we couldn't go there. But we thought we'd check it out anyway, and because we really did want to go fishing there. And uh, that's basically how we got into trouble in the first place. A couple of nights later, the four of us decided to do some fishing out on the lake. So we built this large bonfire to act as a beacon, otherwise you can't find your way back. Made the fire, got in our canoe, left the site, we were out in the water just a few minutes. It was very swampy, a lot of sunken trees and roots, a treacherous kind of area. And out there, started fishing. Uh, maybe 20 minutes into this. We weren't out there very long. We were shining, I was shining a flashlight down in the water looking for structure that we might find some fish in. While I was looking down in the water, one of the fellows from the back yelled, what the hell is that? When I turned around to see what he was looking at, um, here at the end of the lake, just over the tops of the trees, was this huge sphere of light. I mean, it was gigantic. It was the size of a two-story house, not making any sound whatsoever. And it just floated there. We were downwind from it. No humming, no whirring, no whistling, no buzzing, absolutely nothing. At first, we tried to figure out, you know, tried to rationalize, well, what the heck can this thing be? I knew all the things that it wasn't. I knew it was no helicopter. It's not moving like a, a, a weather balloon. So this wasn't anything that I, in my military experience, had ever seen or heard of. So we decided, I think Charlie Fultz said, well, how about if I signal it with a flashlight, see if it does anything? And we said, yeah, great idea, do that. When I did that, a shaft of light just slammed out of the bottom of it. One instant it's not there, and the next it's there. And the minute he signals this thing, it starts moving towards us. And I grabbed the canoe paddle, threw the blade of the paddle into the water. I started paddling as hard as I could. I locked my vision on the fire. Jack kept looking back to see where this thing was, and he kept saying, it's gaining on us. At that point, I think there was a kind of panic, and so we just started paddling wildly to get away from it. I could hear the guys behind me paddling with their hands. Water splashing, yelling, paddle, Charlie, paddle. It made this strange jump through space. It's gaining on us. It was almost right on top of us, coming out and just enveloping us. It can't do that. It can't, things can't do that. The beam was just about to the back of the canoe. We're not going to outrun this thing. That was the last thing that went through my mind before we found ourselves at the beach. Whatever it was, they had outrun it. Or so they thought. And so we got out of the canoe and we turned around and this thing was right in front of us. I mean, it was, you know, just maybe 30, 50 yards tops hovering right over the water. Then it did a really strange thing again. It seemed to implode. Just one shh. It was that quick. And then it would reappear higher up into the sky, real bright again. And it, would, and it seemed to go uh, uh, higher in the sky. It was gaining elevation in steps like that until finally it just took off like a bullet it just went <laughs> faster than that I can't express how it was an instant it was gone in an instant we were dumbfounded we were just standing there uh, wondering what the heck just happened and uh, we seemed like uh, we were kind of in state of shock then they discovered hours of time were missing 
The first sign of it was the fire. And when we went back to our campfire, all that was left was embers, which we thought was a little odd because it seemed to us that from the time we left to go fishing to the time we got back after seeing this thing, only 15 or 20 minutes had elapsed. In fact, I was sure of it. It should still be blazing. It should still have flames four or five, six feet going up in the air. It was just something we could never really explain. It was a mystery. A mystery that would come to haunt them. Come on, girls. Come on, bears. Claire and Diana would be the first to tell you that a firm schedule is the keystone of farm life. But one night, Claire inexplicably lost two hours of time, which not only disrupted their lives, but threatened her sanity. No, 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 no. And for her, like the wieners, it started with a light. I was uh, driving toward the farm about five miles away. I saw lights in the sky, very quiet, didn't hear engine noises of a plane. Pulled over and got out of the car to investigate. In the blink of an eye, I was suddenly back in the vehicle and driving around the corner very fast on two wheels. It was some four miles farther down the road than I last remembered. My ears were bleeding, um, presumably because my earrings were in backwards. I also uh, realized that I had an hour and a half or close to it uh, of time that I could not account for. I didn't have a clue what had taken place during that time. Coming into the house, I think my first reaction was, thank God I'm here. I made it. I made it home. Um, I'm in one piece. I'm sick to my stomach. I'm scared. I'm crazy. My reaction to her first incident was, oh my God, Claire's going crazy. I've given her too much to do. Um, there's just too much stuff going on and she really needs, you know, some time off. But then it happened again. A couple of weeks later, I was driving back from a business meeting and saw lights ahead of me on the road. Suddenly the inside of the cab of the truck lit up so brightly I couldn't see through it. My next conscious memory was landing very hard in the vehicle on the road as if I'd been dropped from above. I was afraid to tell them this had happened again. I didn't want him to think I was crazy. I didn't want him to lock me up. Oh, I thought I was having a nervous breakdown. I've thought that a lot of times. Claire is not the only one to be unhinged by missing time. In comedy, as in life, timing is everything. One night, on the way to a gig in Vermont, Fred realized he'd lost several hours and his entire life began to unravel. For him, too, it started with a sighting. All of a sudden, I see this this thing. It looks like the Goodyear blimp. That's what I thought it was. These lights started flowing over it. It's keeping my attention. I'm looking at it. I'm thinking, well, there's the Goodyear blimp, and pretty soon it's going to say Goodyear. In a few seconds, it's about the size of a volleyball and I'm thinking that's no blimp just as it's coming really close a military plane comes by as the military plane comes into view the uh, supposed blimp takes off to the north and it outdistances the plane in a matter of seconds it's gone got to the show and I had the one of the worst sets ever I could not get the microphone to function for me every time I would pick it up out of the mic stand 
the thing would short out on me as I got to a punchline. So I have to leave the mic in the stand for the rest of the show. The next comic gets up there. He has no problems with it. He can pick it up and use it without anything going wrong with it. Five or ten minutes down the road, I see the thing again. The lights are flowing over it. And it covers itself with lights. And when it's all lit up, it starts descending sideways. It's not a blimp. And it kept coming down, and I'm looking at it. It's coming down. It's out of control. It's gonna crash. And then, nothing. It was all over. Only a haze remained. The sky is all lit up red. I have to pull into a motel. I'm exhausted. I can't drive any further. It's 1.30 in the morning. It's 15 miles from where I started, and it's three hours later. So there's no way I drove the whole way at five miles an hour. I got a lot of missing time there. It's just, I don't understand. You see a bright, inexplicable light in the sky, and you lose two hours of time. Something seems wrong. At first, you run over the episode in your mind, trying to make sense of it for yourself. The next day, we woke up, um, broke camp, didn't talk much at all. In fact, I don't remember talking about it at all. We were kind of just within our own thoughts, just wandering around, doing our chores to break camp and... We didn't speak about it much at all. We broke camp, got in our canoe, started paddling away. Several hours later, we started remembering this light that we saw the night before. And that was when we really started discussing it. If you can't make sense of what happened, you could try telling someone else. But if you do, you might discover, just as the wieners did, that no one seems to believe you. We signaled a ranger who we saw crossing the lake to come over. We told him what we saw and we asked him, you know, if anyone else had reported seeing these things, uh, if they had seen any of these things, what the, you know, what the hell's going on here? We were sure someone else had seen it. Somebody else had to see this thing. It was enormous. So we told the ranger and his, uh, his sidekick, Matt, and his reaction was, uh, if it isn't the bears or the bugs the campers are complaining about, it's the doggone Martians now. I guess I'm going to just have to get out my ray gun, unquote. You know, so I mean, which we didn't think was very funny. We said, no, no, you know, we're not, this isn't a joke. We're not joking. This is for real. It really happened. And, he's, and uh, Charlie was smoking a pipe because he was trying to quit smoking cigarettes. And I remember he had his pipe there and he was trying to light his pipe. And the ranger said, I don't know what you've been putting in that pipe you're smoking there, boys, but I'd lay off it for a while if I were you. And we were like, oh, no, no one is ever going to believe us. So nobody believes you. What would you do? The Wieners were on a simple camping trip. The first ranger told them not to go to Smith Pond because the water was too low. But they went anyway. Then they had a strange encounter with the light and lost two hours of time. The first person they told thought they were crazy. So they decided to drop it and go on with their trip. But the very next day, something happened that made them start wondering all over again. The next day, we're on another part of the lake and um, where the lake system turns into the river part of the Allagash Waterway. And there's a stretch of uh, rapids called Chase Rapids, class four. And my brother and I had never done rapids in a canoe. We were uh, really worried about it because we had all this gear with us. So we, we wanted to portage. And um, we were talking to a, another ranger about portaging around the rapids. And he said, oh, well, what are you worried about? There are no rapids right now. And we were like, what are you talking about? It's two and a half miles of rapids here. 
And he said, we just had a hurricane come through a week and a half ago, and the water level is like two and a half to three feet above normal, so all the rocks are underwater. It's smooth sailing relatively, which I thought was a really strange because when we first landed on the lakes, this other ranger told us that the water level was too low to go to Smith Pond. So to me, that was a direct contradiction. And in fact, we told him that. We said, well, oh, that's a little odd because uh, Ranger so-and-so told us that the water level was low for this time of year, and that's why we couldn't go to Smith Pond. I mean, as soon as we said that, this guy just turned his back to us and walked away and wouldn't talk to us anymore. We thought this was the official reaction. That was the end of it. So we, you know, it kind of discouraged us from making any other official reports. When Claire told Diana about dropping from the sky on her truck and losing two hours of time, Diana didn't have to believe her. Diana is Claire's boss. She could have fired Claire and hired someone else, but she didn't. Perhaps it was loyalty or friendship, or perhaps it was something else. I tried to help Claire as, as much as I could, but she didn't want to talk about it. She didn't want to deal with it at all. She, she was just hoping it would, it would go away and, and it really wouldn't happen again. I, I want everything normal. Um, I want to be in control. And I felt very out of control. But my reaction was completely different. I wasn't involved. Um, I had nothing to do with it. But when Claire had her second experience, Diana began to feel that she was involved. Diana's mind was set in motion. And for her, too, a trickle of memories began. She remembered a little bit more of that incident, and it seemed a little stranger to me. And it got me thinking to a time a couple years back when we had seen some really bright lights outside the back door and gone out on the porch and watched them. And we were just thoroughly fascinated that we have actually seen a UFO. So I started finding every book I could on the subject and started reading like crazy. It was fascinating to me. Life on the farm had to go on. There were chores to do, pregnant mares to care for. But both women noticed that a blanket of strangeness had descended over their lives. Everywhere they turned, something seemed odd or out of place. At first, they chalked it up to imagination or coincidence until disturbing events happened too often to ignore. As Claire had more and more memories, it, it got stranger and stranger. She started having memories of strange hands. Um, we connected the lights we'd seen a couple years earlier. When we started becoming more aware of what was going on around us, we realized that there were an awful lot of very odd coincidences. Coincidences like uh, journal entries that were on the computer disappearing entirely. Uh, lights going on and off by themselves, whether they're plugged in or not. Televisions going on and off by themselves. Uh, clocks stopping consistently at 3 a.m. every morning. Going to bed with uh, clean-shaven legs and waking up with hairy legs. After a while, you start to wonder if these are really coincidences or if there isn't some other explanation for them. I got concerned when I knew we couldn't handle it anymore. I knew we needed more help and more knowledge than, than we had. So I started looking through the phone book, and luckily I found the Fund for UFO Research. I called them and, and talked with them, and my first question was, is it possible for somebody to be kidnapped by a UFO? They didn't want to give us too, inf too much information from what they knew, but it just seemed that everything that Claire was telling them was all too familiar to them. It, it matched patterns that they knew about that we knew nothing about. It's kind of frightening. As we learned more and more about this phenomenon and began to remember more and more about it, both Diana and I began to realize that we were associating everything that happened to us practically with this phenomenon, with abductions, with aliens, with UFOs, and we're becoming paranoid. We had to learn to separate what was real and explainable, although maybe a little strange, with something that was truly connected to what was happening to us. And there's a very fine line between the two. Please, a nice round of applause. 
applause for the comedy of Fred. My name's Fred. When Fred returned from his failed comedy gig in Vermont, after a bizarre sighting and missing time, he couldn't help but tell someone. Sometimes he wishes he'd kept his mouth shut. As soon as I got back to town, I mean, it was the first, the only thing I could talk about. It was the biggest thing that had ever happened to me, and I couldn't keep quiet about it. But, you know, I was telling other comedians about it, and they're not the people to tell. <laughs> Fred's UFO story started to damage his reputation in the business. I told one agent who, one producer who was a former air traffic controller, and he just would have nothing to do with it. He just said, oh, you're talking to the wrong person here, and stopped giving me work. But a damaged reputation wasn't the only problem Fred faced. It just shattered my confidence. I mean, the key to doing comedy, to putting it over, is to be self-confident. And, you know, especially with the type of stuff I do, the self-deprecating stuff, it's, it's right on the edge where you're... If, you know, you don't do it right, the audience isn't going to buy it. I couldn't really focus on jokes when I've got UFOs plaguing my thoughts. I want my career back. So, Fred writes to comedy clubs and agents, like a man in deep water, reaching out to those who can keep him from sinking. But in truth, Fred's nemesis now is his own mind. And until he reaches into it and digs deeper into the mystery of his missing time, he knows his career will remain on hold.